my name, I'm Police Constable Nick Samaras, but everyone just calls me Nick. I'm a Toronto Police Officer. I've been with the service for 15 years. I've been with our mobile crisis intervention team for the last uh, just over a year. Uh, the North York General Hospital crisis team in North York, we've uh, just started up last year. And this is my partner, Roberto Yashi, who will talk a bit about himself. Uh, thanks, Nick. Uh, good morning to everybody here. Thanks so much for having us here today. You want to speak louder? <laughs> no problem. Uh, good morning to everybody. Thank you so much for the opportunity to be here. My partner and I, it's uh, in meeting community partners out here that we serve is a fantastic thing for us because we finally get to meet faces of places that we sometimes refer to. So thank you so much for the opportunity. As my partner had said, my name is uh, Roberto. I'm a mental health nurse. I work for North York General Hospital. I've been a psych nurse for approximately 15 years and been doing MCIT, uh, and you'll see it in our slide presentation. North York General Hospital received their MCIT program last year, uh, May 28th, and uh, it's been now a year in existence, and we seem to have had some really good um, efforts out there in, in supporting those uh, with mental health uh, challenges. Uh, you're going to learn today about what exactly it is that we do and um, there are times when we've come into uh, contact with individuals uh, as the gentleman had said that are a little bit more in terms of um, in needs and when dealing with them so uh, I hope you enjoy the presentation and uh, we'll be more than happy to answer any questions at all if if it seems like I am uh, trembling, it's because I am a little nervous. So uh, um, I'm going to try to, to, I've never had uh, the opportunity to have somebody uh, sign uh, for me. So it's a great opportunity for me. I've never had that in all of my nursing uh, career. So this is a first for me. So if you guys can bear with me, we'll try to get through this as uh, painfully as, uh, or painless as possible. <laughs> <laughs> so, uh, any questions before we start? Anybody want to know? Oh, it's fine. So you're doing great. We're doing all right? Okay, good. Anybody want to know what MCIT stands for? <laughs> Who said it? <laughs> okay, well, uh, um, Nick and I uh, are from the Mediterranean, so we like to put it as the Mediterranean crisis intervention. <laughs> so... Uh, so without further ado, we're going to start the uh, the slide presentation, and uh, Nick and I are going to uh, are going to man this together. So, just roughly, how long is yeah. your presentation? Ooh. About twenty to thirty minutes plus questions. Okay, twenty thirty, and then well, cause we usually take a break, but if it's not that long, we can do it, and then we can take a break. Sure. Maybe do questions after. Absolutely. Fantastic. Yeah, that would be great. Okay. All right. So without further ado, we're going to go through our um, our slide presentations. If anybody wants it there longer, just let us know, and we'll uh, we'll do it accordingly. Okay. I just want to make sure everyone can hear me. Okay. Yeah, if, if anybody needs me to speak up, just raise your hand. I tend to have a soft voice, and this is my first MCIT presentation. I need you to speak up just a bit. Just a bit? Okay. okay. Let, let me know if. So as Roberto mentioned, the MCIT stands for the Mobile Crisis Intervention Team. It's a partnership between the Toronto Police Service and several local Toronto area hospitals. The MCIT program itself has been in existence for approximately 15 years. It first started uh, early 2000, Roberto, I believe. Yeah, yeah. And I believe the first hospital was St. Michael's Hospital. And they were partnered up with some of the downtown divisions uh, in response to uh, an increase in calls with uh, individuals experiencing a mental health crisis or emotional crisis and to better improve the police response to those situations. It, uh, it slowly branched out. I believe the next hospital was St. Joseph Hospital. Again, yeah. another downtown area hospital in 2005. Uh, and another year later, it expanded to cover the Scarborough area. And then in 2008, over towards the west end of the city with Humber River Regional Hospital. 
And then in the last two years, it's expanded further to cover Toronto East General and North York General Hospital. So as of now, for 2014, every Toronto Police Division has coverage from the MCIT. There are six hospitals in partnership and there are approximately eight teams working citywide. Uh, some hospitals have two teams just because of the volume of calls that they have. At this time it's not a 24-hour service at this point. Typical hours are between usually 11 a.m. to about 9 p.m. Uh, they do work stat holidays and eventually in time it will likely expand to be a 24-hour coverage but it's taken us 15 years to get to the point where it's a citywide thing so again expansion of 24 hours is likely inevitable but we're getting there slowly but surely. So the team consists of a Toronto police officer in uniform and a mental health nurse. We uh, operate, mostly we operate in marked scout police vehicles. Uh, when the teams originally began in 2000, the police officers were in plain clothes and they operated a usually an unmarked police vehicle. There's pros and cons to having a plain clothes officer and having an officer in uniform. Having an officer in plain clothes is obviously more comfortable for the client. Uh, it can be less embarrassing to them if sometimes they're concerned and the neighbors see a, a marsh police car outside of their home. Uh, for whatever reason, it was decided to go back to a uniformed officer. Um, there's benefits to that as well. It shows the community that the mobile crisis team is in existence and out there. Many people don't know that we exist at this point. Um, as well, we, we do respond to calls that are uh, of an emergency nature and to be in a marked police car does allow us to get there a little bit faster than if we're in a, a regular car. So there are pros and cons to either side. And uh, I don't know what the future holds, if they're gonna maintain having us in a uniform capacity or go back to the plain clothes capacity. It seems to be a topic of ongoing discussion. But as for now, we, are, we do operate in a, in a uniform capacity. And uh, officers and nurses that work in the mobile crisis intervention team have this patch here to uh, differentiate themselves from the other police officers. And our nurses are designated as well as to being a nurse on their uh, external uniform there. So talk a little bit about what we actually do. We are a secondary response to 911 calls involving in individuals experiencing a mental health or emotional crisis. Uh, our goal is to attend the situation. Sometimes we'll be attending in response to police officers who have already gone ahead to a call of this nature and decided that it's a call that would benefit us attending. Or we will hear the call be broadcast and we will attend at the same time as police. So we go there and we assess the situation and we attempt to stabilize and diffuse whatever crisis is happening at that point. Uh, we provide support and counseling to the individual and uh, we make a determination if they require uh, attending a hospital for further assessment or if we can keep this individual in the community and perhaps connect them to follow-up services instead. Uh, so our goal is obviously to quickly de-escalate the situation and to avoid unnecessary um, arrest or emergency room visits. I can tell you being a police officer for 15 years, when I first started this job, the typical police response to somebody in an emotional crisis was just take them to the hospital. We weren't experts in mental health. Our knowledge of resources in the mental health field was limited. And uh, we were taught basically to err on the side of the caution if somebody was uh, in a crisis, take them to the hospital and let a doctor deal with them. That wasn't always necessarily the best course of action for an individual. Having a nurse trained in mental health allows us to bring the nurse now into the community. We can bring them on scene and we can do an assessment there rather than just arbitrarily having to take someone to the hospital all the time, which may not necessarily be what they need. 
so we can cut down on un unnecessary hospital visits. It lessens the burden on the healthcare system. Um, and sorry, I just lost my train of thought there for a moment. Another thing that the mobile crisis prevention team does is we assist with the execution of mental health uh, forms. Um, there are several forms on the Mental Health Act that requires police to take somebody to the hospital. Uh, most of the time, the individual is not going to want to go to the hospital. So in the past, you would have police officers show up and attempt to convince the person that they need to go to the hospital. Having a mental health nurse um, makes that a little bit easier. Uh, as well, with individuals that we deem don't have to go to the hospital, in our opinion, we often arrange follow-ups to make sure that the decision we made was the right one. Uh, and it gives us a chance to reevaluate with them at a later time, maybe a week, two weeks, a month, to see if things have changed, have things improved, have they gotten worse? Do we have to revisit this situation? Maybe we do have to take them to the hospital. So that's another thing that we do. To further expand on the roles of myself and my partner, the role of the officer is to ensure the safety of everybody, the client, the nurse, other police officers. The officer is equipped with use of force options should they be necessary. The majority of our outcomes are peaceful. However, sometimes people in a state of emotional crisis um, can be violent, unfortunately. So the officer is there with the appropriate use of force option should that become necessary. Typically it doesn't though. As well, the officer has the authority under the Mental Health Act to take a person to the hospital if they're a danger to themselves, if they're a danger to somebody else, if they are, in the officer's opinion, not able to look out to themselves. The officer has that ability to take them to the hospital. As for the role of the nurse, the nurse, again, is there to provide a clinical assessment on site. The nurse will have knowledge of the medications that police normally wouldn't and what they're usually for. As well, the nurse is gonna have knowledge of mental health disorders that the police might not have. So it's that expertise that we have in the field by having a nurse there. Our nurses also have access to resources and programs that, through the hospital that we normally wouldn't. And as well, the nurse is a comfort factor. Um, not every client is comfortable dealing with the police. Some are, some aren't. Having a nurse there gives them somebody else to speak to. I don't know, Fabro, you want to elaborate further on the roles? Uh, yeah, I will. I guess um, I'm just gonna I'm gonna take them through the, the sure. further slide presentation then. Uh, so, folks, what you're looking at on the board right now is the City of Toronto MCIT program. What you're seeing on that board uh, are all of the divisions that cover Metropolitan Toronto. And as my partner was saying, every division has now its own uh, mobile crisis intervention team. So we are citywide. And those are, and those of you that are, uh, know the other uh, stakeholders, this is the breakdown of the central lens and what the lens look like throughout Toronto. If you guys can see that on the board, I'm not sure. And those are all the hospitals that are currently, uh, that uh, are the second half of the mobile crisis team, so. So as my partner was saying, uh, there's a, the partnership is a uniformed officer and a mental health nurse. The, uh, I guess the combination uh, is one that has been uh, in the works, as my partner was saying, since 2000, it's been here. And uh, they're finding that uh, the combination of a nurse and an officer in, an, in when attending mental health 
uh, calls are very effective in being able to diffuse them appropriately. Um, uh, as my partner was saying from the from the nurse end, uh, so I'll, I'll give you, I'll paint the scenario for you. We go to a scene and and uh, there's an individual that's experiencing some kind of mental health crisis at the time, whether it be a threat suicide, whether it be they may be in a possible uh, psychotic state, they may be in a state of uh, being under the influence of substances. So when we arrived there, uh, as um, my partner was saying, the, the police aspect of this team is obviously safety. The mine, my officer, uh, and the individual that we're dealing with. Not all scenarios, uh, unfortunately, don't end up at a kitchen table discussing it over tea. It's usually a little bit more dynamic than that. So once we get to a scene, we, uh, we assess it uh, fast as to how exactly it's going to go. We usually talk about the scene before we get there because we have all of the uh, information that comes across on dispatch. And as my partner was saying, uh, as a nurse, we have um, other intel that we bring if we know the individual if they have a history with the hospital that we deal with, which is North York General, are there any medications? So when we get there, we already have a, uh, a very good understanding of what's going on. I wish I can tell you that it's always like that, but it's not. For the most part, before we go into a situation, we do have pretty good a pretty good understanding of, okay, this is what we are gonna go through. And we discuss it before we get there. And we're kind of, uh, we're always in sync in terms of, okay, this is how we're gonna approach it. So we go into a situation and um, from Nick's aspect, it's safety is what's the first and foremost, which is paramount. Once that gets established, then um, we just feed off each other in terms of uh, in just our signs. Nick will usually introduce me, and then if the individual is talking with Nick and they seem to be building a rapport, fantastic. And I'll just sit on the periphery. If Nick wants to, if he feels that, well, you know what, I'm gonna throw in the nurse aspect and see if we can, then we'll go through it that way. The beautiful thing about our team which is rare these days is we have time throw time at any situation with the right uh, repertoire of rapport building and uh, we've as my partner was saying it's rare that we have had a situation gone bad. Very rare, actually. And when I mean rare, I mean the individual had to be cuffed. That's all I mean. I don't mean like rare, it's like, you know, someone got hurt. So, uh, and we've been in existence for a year now and a month, and that's the, kind of the way I want to keep it. I just find in dealing with, uh, in anybody, in that state, uh, in that current state of excitability, that's all you got to do is throw time at it and have an understanding of, um, we're all, um, we're all human beings, and I can tell you from myself, I can tell you that uh, you know, some days are better than other days. Some days I manage better than other days. And it's no different than the individuals that we serve. So um, having that understanding of that, like to go somewhere and to, you know, oh my God, it's them again. Like, that's just wrong. It's not gonna help, I'll tell you that. So that's our biggest approach. That's our biggest, um, it, you know, it's great. Uh, I like to think I'm pretty well versed in mental health disorders and my career is uh, giving me that opportunity. Uh, Nick is uh, from, uh, I don't wanna say teaching him, but he's always asking questions and he's broadened his knowledge base. So we already have that and we have time. 
it doesn't get any better than that folks it really doesn't so once we arrive on scene and we can uh, get it let's say to a kitchen table to uh, sitting on a curb to sitting on a patio wherever um, the next thing that happens is the mental health assessment is anybody aware of the mental health assessment in here as to what the components are of a mental health assessment what it means to be mentally assessed. Help me out, guys. Um, no. Yeah, go ahead. But just looking for, um, have they been harmful to themselves? Or sure. Others, um, yeah. Of the environment. Yeah. Um, now, like yeah, fantastic. I can get, uh, I can get clinical with you guys, and I really don't want to get clinical with you guys. I just, um, when the mental health assessment is going on, or when I'm uh, doing a mental health assessment, there are categories that. I capture as I go through it. Uh, one of them, appearance. What the individual looks like. That's first and foremost, right? This is all the objective data that you're going to get. Are they disheveled? Are they well kept? Are they overly well kept? Are they very well kept? Are they, uh, well, they should look better than that. Right? So we'll go through that. I'll go through behaviors. Are they belligerent? Are they cooperative? Are they appropriate? Are they able to um, are they able to sit through an interaction and engage? Next thing I'll look at is mood and affect. Now mood is just that. How are you feeling today? Uh, I'm happy, I'm sad, I'm pissed off. Can I say that? Uh, I'm whatever the, the, the case, right? So, um, and we'll look at that. And how long has that mood been with you? Is it just today? Is it just this instant because of a situational crisis, which is something that went on? Yeah. I have a question, because when they see you in a uniform, yeah. does it escalate the situation possibly, or does it de-escalate? Yeah. I... I wouldn't say that they escalate physically. You can see, you can sense sometimes a sense of discomfort when they see the officer. And oftentimes when I, when I sense that, I'll step back and I'll let my partner, who's still dressed somewhat like a police officer, but he'll identify himself cl clearly as a nurse. And usually that tends to calm the situation down. We've, we've got a pretty good, we get a pretty good sense of when one of us is, more, being more accepted and the other one just kind of steps back so but as to like making them further violent we haven't had that situation where they no. become violent when we've attended they've no. always i mean once we've identified ourselves, as my partner was saying, like I'll like you know I don't I don't carry anything on me, I don't have any weapons, I don't have any cuffs, I don't have anything. So like when I do the you know and I turn around and they're like, oh wow, he really doesn't have anything on. And then, as my partner was saying, we've never come across anyone that said, I don't think you're. It's never happened. It's never happened. Go ahead. I just wanted to add on to that because I had your team come to the place that I work oh, at nice. for a young lady who had uh, who has OPD, oppositional defiance disorder. Yeah. Uh, as well as depression yeah. and developmental disability. Yeah. Uh, wasn't aware that the call was made uh, by her mother. Yeah. And you guys actually they showed up to the, her day program. Right. So right away, like after after processing with her after, she yeah. said when she saw the police officer, she knew it was serious. Right. But the nurse was really nice. So, yeah. I get that a lot. <laughs> Sorry. Just, oh. just, just to show. No, no, I get that a lot. Yeah. It, I think for her, she was fearful. Right. That there was a police officer. She knew she had to comply. Yeah. Um, because normally, when even if you ask her to say she wants to use the bathroom at 10, but we were going on the trip. Right. And would say, hey, between 9 and 9.30 is the time to go. It's like, but no, no, but I always go at 10. And, and that's a part of the OBB. Um, it, it's really hard to get to change to something as small as a bathroom routine. And then when we have two individuals come in, and we were kind of thrown off. I, I never had an interaction uh, before where there was a form of or there was a form. Two? Two. That's basically. 
of the piece? Yes, yes. Yeah, it's a form two. Form two, okay. Yeah. And um, it was new to us. Um, and she complied. And after she did say that the nurse was good, um, he didn't have a gap. So the gut was a huge thing. Yeah. Um, so, so then my role was to explain um, why the nurse was there and why the police was there. And at least you got to go in the, in, in the car and you didn't have to walk to the hospital. So you're trying to make jokes out of it at this point. Because yeah. it works for us. Uh, sure. It really works for us. No, for sure. But I think it, it also experiences, that was her first experience. Yeah. Now had she had experiences with maybe a police officer in a different setting, yeah. that would have threw her off right away. Uh, I, yeah, that's, you know what, that's a, that's a very common theme that we keep hearing. Uh, like our whole uh, mandate is to build bridges. That's what we want. And uh, when it, in executing forms, anyone knows what a form two is? Yeah. You go to the justice of the peace. You bring your present. Uh, you bring your evidence, and uh, he or she will issue. Go ahead. I have a question about that. Okay. Are you guys able to uh, go against what that form is? For example. You know what? That's a great question. Yeah. No, we we get that a lot. Um, so the actual form is a court order, right? Given that, uh, given that in this partnership, um, we can assess. I can give report when we get to hospital, and at, like I you know, I see either the doc or the triage nurse, or uh, I'll put in there my two cents and advocate for the individual if. You know what? I'm not seeing what the form is based on, so uh, you may want to look at that. You may want to consider that. And when uh, you know, it's not the first time I brought someone in on a form two, and the individual, the the doctor there, released them because they didn't think that they warranted further uh, assessment. So given that, uh, I'll either reinforce or I will tell them I will be in accordance with. So that's kind of what the nice thing is about this team is that I can provide that assessment piece. Yes. Yeah. Seeing the court order, it, it specifies yeah. that police have to take the person, yeah. so our hands are tied at that point. Is it there's so they make situations where it may not just be something I don't want to say, I want to say small for the for the No, person. no, no, you for can't say that. Right. You can say that. In this situation, it yes. was, she easily calls the police on her daughter. Mm -hmm. The daughter didn't want to buy bread yeah. and with her money. And then she's tired of it. So that's where I would yeah. want, I always wanted to know that. Uh, oh, we've we've often it. looked at the forms and looked at it and said, no, we're not seeing this, but we're yeah. obligated to take them. We'll go to the hospital. We'll explain to the doctor mm -hmm. what we think. Perfect. And a lot of times people take them on the form too are released because the yeah. doctor doesn't see them. seeing that and the family still has concerns that the person needs to go to the hospital, then they'll be advised to seek out a form, whether Form 2, which is issued by a Justice of the Peace, or Form 1, which is issued by a doctor that knows the patient. Um, another, well, I was going to say another example of a non-emergency call is the, is a similar circumstance when a, when a family member might call and say, I'm having concerns about, about my son, daughter, brother, whoever. Um, they have a mental illness, they're not taking their medications, they're not violent at this time. I do have concerns though that they may be going down the slippery slope and I would like police to come and talk to them. So that would be kind of non-emergency. They're not doing anything imminent at that time. So that, that's that's what would be a non-emergency. That would be a different role. 
is on the street. Sometimes I ask yeah. community based on the yeah. when I've had yeah. issues around levels of instability. Right. So before you can actually offer access to your services as well or so before 2014, there were some divisions that didn't have a mobile crisis team. So the community liaison officer was a de facto liaison and would try and access services for whoever had uh, the concern. Now that all the divisions have the mobile crisis team, if it comes across to the community liaison officer, they'll pass it on to us usually. Can I just add something? Absolutely. Yes. When we first started, we had a client who, before the mobile crisis came into existence, you might even know our client, I'm not going to mention names, but the story might sound familiar, and uh, she would call police every day, sometimes twice a day, and police would respond. Which one? Police. Uh, yeah. okay. And uh, that was obviously a huge drain on police resources. Um, every day, like every day police were going there, and she was being taken to the hospital at least once a week, sometimes twice, maybe even three times a week. Just constant ER visits and she would go to the hospital and be discharged. And clearly a drain on the healthcare system and not beneficial to the client at all because they weren't getting the help that they needed. Police would go, they didn't know what to do with her. They'd take her to the hospital, the hospital would discharge her. And it was just an endless cycle, unhealthy cycle. So we got to know the individual and uh, eventually what happened, probably within a month was police were no longer going, we would be going. Uh, maybe every other day, every three days. Um, and when we went there, we would uh, assess the situation and say, you know what, this person does not need to go to the hospital this time. So we were reducing the ER visits. Sometimes we did have to take her to the hospital. But most times we didn't. So we were able to reduce the amount of times police were going. It came to the point where police themselves were no longer going. We were going and then we had to figure out how to, okay, now we can't be going there every day because it's, again, it's not, it's not what they need and it makes us unavailable to those who do need us. So we eventually hooked them up to the Reconnect program. And it came to the point where she went from having weekly ER admissions to not having ER admission in eight months. And regular primary response officers were no longer, they hadn't attended maybe in a year. Yeah. And we were maybe attending once a month just to check in. Um, so that's one example of, yeah. Um, borderline personality disorder. And yep. we, have, we have quite a few of those. Yeah. So would you be working also if, let's say, a plan is in place where they identify together with you a means of responding that might be a little bit more functional? Yeah. Yeah, I find uh, I find those with a that have a robust personality. I find that if you um, there are definite um, evidence-based ways on how to ease that individual's um, sometimes unnecessary wants uh, when it comes to supports. So what we try to do is uh, we try to work with that individual uh, in a manner that's going to be effective for them, especially those that have borderline personality disorders. We're bringing you to hospital is not going to be what you're going to be needing at that time 
given the situation. Like my partner said, we do end up in hospital sometimes. Uh, but I find that if we pad them appropriately, we find that our interactions have diminished greatly in the community. So do we work with that individual as in like on a, in their uh, repertoire of uh, coping? Hey, you know, give a mobile crisis line a call if you ever need to, if you're having a bad day and you just want to leave a message, yeah, give the mobile crisis number a call and do that. You can do that. We do have to be careful though because it is a challenge that people like dealing with us better than just dealing with police. So we have to avoid the pitfall where they only want to call us yeah. because we're not a 24 hour service. We had issues when we first started where some of our chronic, um, more, mostly the border, the borderline personality disorders would call the station looking for us and only for us. And uh, when we're not working, right? Which is uh, which can be dangerous because that person might need an intervention, and if they're calling only for us, yeah, and they're not getting any help because we're not available because of the hours, we want to kind of avoid that. So that's why we're not really a direct response; we're a secondary response. If somebody's experiencing a group crisis, you're supposed to be directed to 911. That way, if we're not available, we might be on another call. Yeah. Because we take our time on our calls, as much time as we need. If it's an hour, two hours, the whole day, we'll spend that time with the client. But if somebody is in a crisis, they need help, whether it's us or the police that goes, they need to go through 911. The community services can actually provide you with that information so that the call does call in again. They can request, yeah. yeah. You know, these are the collaterals that are involved mm -hmm. in the community, yeah. and it's better to redirect it via yeah. that we, or if there's a plan in place to address we, we definitely we definitely put boundaries in place for us we need to we definitely put boundaries in place for us so that like our relationship isn't going to be ongoing for the rest of your days it's it's going to be limited to what we can provide for you so we will respond to an emergency situation we will provide you with support we may even provide you with a follow-up but eventually our services aren't going to be needed anymore do you get that or oh no i can get it okay service right eminent risk is always at the forefront of our priority. of our priority so uh, have we um, have we interacted uh, with individuals that uh, have borderline personality disorder uh, diagnosis yeah we have and have we uh, channeled them into other supports yeah we have and we do that and we look for to do that. Go ahead. Yeah, whatever happens, some replacement calls to dispatch. And of course, things happen quickly. The dispatch isn't sure who to call, so they call a police officer. The police officer responds, and they realize. It happens all the time. It might be beyond their expertise. It happens all the time. Is that police officer able to call you, or would they follow it through, and then you get involved later? Like, what's. Actually, it may even be before that. Dispatch has a great, uh, and to correct me, Nick, if I'm wrong, uh, dispatch has a, a phenomenal way in knowing how to channel the calls. If uh, he or she deems that, you know what, this sounds like it has uh, an emotionally disturbed person's flavor, they'll, um, they'll send us a message and say, hey, can you guys attend this call? Or... Calls. And we also monitor the calls as well. Like what will be a C ambulance call? May be an individual that's having a crisis that is not going to hospital and yet they've just taken a whole bunch of pills. And now EMS always calls for police support. 
they're not going to take the individual or apprehend the individual. Yeah, right. So we're, we're hearing the calls as you're dispatching. If we're available, we'll yeah. go to it. Maybe Definitely. we'll be tied up in another call and we can't. The officers on scene will, if they can't wait for us to attend, they'll make a decision. If it's something that can wait for us to visit later, they usually ask us, can you go by this address later and speak to this person? So it, we do both, right? If we're available, we'll go. If not, and we're needed, the officers usually let us know, can you go speak to Joe or whoever? And uh, we have some concerns about him. We don't think he needs to go to the hospital, but uh, he may need a more in-depth yeah, assessment. Yeah, may benefit from supports or... We, we get a lot of referrals from the officers. Yeah. Do you just deal with adults or, or is it children? Oh, zero to 99. Yeah. 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 I just had, uh, I did, uh, when did I write? Tuesday? Tuesday, Wednesday of this week, I did a, I had a call at a, a private school uh, for a 10 year old uh, who, uh, what they had claimed was threatening suicide. So, yeah, we do. And do you deal differently with children? Uh, they're, uh, you know, I, um, as a nurse, uh, so I've covered a variety of areas in nursing. Uh, I can't say that uh, pediatrics was a favorite of mine, but um, I'm aware of the uh, interaction styles uh, that are going to be more appropriate with an adult as opposed to uh, a 10 year old who suffers from Asperger's, who you show up there and you're trying to have this interaction with him and he's just flying through the jungle gym yeah. while talking to you and answering my questions. Yeah. Oh yeah, then here, uh, yeah, what was the question? <laughs> and, like, and I'm not gonna ask a, a, a 10 year old um, that's obviously trying to manage the best way he can to say, hey, can you sit down with me please? Cause it's really like, it's bothering me as a clinician that you're running around. Like that's just not accurate, right? Yeah. So uh, from, I hope I'm answering your question. Like as a clinician, I, I come, um, I come well versed in a variety of, cause I deal with all populations, right? So we can't be, I can, Nick calls me an expert all the time. I hate when he does that, but like it, I'm aware and like Nick is aware of how your interaction is gonna change between an individual that's 10 and an individual that's 84, an individual that's 35, an individual that's 65. Each of those individuals are that, they're an individual, number one. Number two, they're going through some growth and development process at that time. And you need to be aware of that. Now who you subscribe to in terms of developmental processes, whether it be Erickson, Piaget, I'm not sure. I just, my understanding of it, as uh, basic as it is, it serves me well into what I do. So yeah, th are there different ways to communicate? Yeah, of course there are. So, and I'm very aware of that. Just a question. Yeah. Children, when those calls are made, do the parents have to have permission? Yeah, you know what? The uh, the confidentialities around that whole thing are just like staggering. And uh, when we show up, um, generally, when, I, when we if we want to talk to to a child, we need a parent or the teacher connect on behalf. But if somebody's in crisis or in danger themselves, yeah. we have a, a an over, an override. To intervene. And I mean. We have to step in if somebody's a danger to themselves. We got to we got to interact. So the, let's say I'm a parent. I have a ten year old who goes to the same private yeah. school or any school. Yeah. And the teachers couldn't get a hold of me to say, hey, you know, one student said that in the bathroom he said he was like hurting himself. Right. Um, and they call right away. Do you find those parents might be upset that because? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Small. He does it all the time. He picks the skin all the time. Oh no, the the. So the call. I've never experienced it. I don't know. Okay. Well, the call that I went to uh, this week. Uh, I know that uh, you know 
I, uh, being a parent, I can tell you getting called from a school is pretty, uh, yeah, upsetting, agitating, like, oh my God, what's going on? Uh, I'm one of those parents that like, you know, if you're not profusely bleeding or like in need of, I don't want to get a call from the school. So uh, one of the parents uh, that were there showed up and when she seen police response to uh, the individual, the comment was, wow, is this a terrorist attack? Uh, no, this is just, this is what happens in this country when you call 911. This is what the response is going to be and we live in a beautiful country like that. So, you know, you kind of, I get that there may have been a lot of apprehensions that she may be having, right? So, I, I don't look at the comment and say, lady, uh, like, it's just not yeah, accurate. No, right? Like, you know, I let her... Uh, we don't take things personally. No, that's the thing. Yeah. We never do, right? So, go ahead, miss. I know you've been up there for a bit. Um, thank you. Uh, it sounds to me, from what you're describing about how you were, that there's three key factors. One is the um, time, yep. which is huge. Yep. The other one is um, the compassion or openness that you come with, yep. two of you. Uh, and the third is this some kind of working understanding of mental health issues and uh, and how that impacts a person in a family. Mm -hmm. So I'm wondering if, you know, notwithstanding how much knowledge you actually bring, more detailed knowledge than that, can that trickle down to regular police? Because a lot of crises don't happen between 11 a.m. and 9 p.m. And then we have, you know, I've had a client, a 10-year-old, who was just having an outburst. Yes, he was breaking things in the classroom. Um, but he wasn't really, all the teachers needed to do was take up everybody else. Okay, and yes. Let him, you know, finish what, yeah. what, what he was doing, really, and yeah. let him calm down. Instead, they called, they couldn't reach the parent, uh, and the safety plan was to call the police. A 10 year old uh, put in handcuffs, taken to sick kids, handcuffed there to the bed. They're like, it seems very excessive. Um, Especially since no one was in any real danger, there was no weapons, or no, no right. scissors, like nothing. And so I'm wondering if there's education? Any, kind of, any kind of education that you're providing the police? for the police, yep. uh, regular police. We do lectures with our police officers on a regular basis, and uh, they're slowly getting experience when they see us on a call. I remember one call we first, when we first started, we went to a call where the police officers attended first, and we showed up there, and uh, we were met by a supervisor who told us, she's going to the hospital, I want you to talk to her and find out which hospital to take her to. And we said, thank you very much. We're going to talk to her, see what the situation is. If we think she needs to the hospital, we'll take her to the hospital. So we had a long chat with the client and determined that they didn't need to go to the hospital. Came up with a safety plan for her. Formed the other officers and supervisors. This was our plan. And it was like, they just, their eyes just opened up like they hadn't considered the things we put in place for this client. So, it is, a, it is a wall that has to be broken down. It's, it's taking time, but it's slowly getting, slowly breaking down. Even myself, like the, the year I've been here, it's opened my eyes and I know that not everybody needs to go to the hospital. And I have a better, I have better ways of coming up with safety plans for people now that I never would have thought of not working with a nurse before. So it is, and we do trainings with them on a regular basis. So it's slowly getting out there. And as we have more teams and now it's, every division has it, but. Uh, you might have asked this earlier, but just so I can leave with some information here. Uh, every division, like every 54, 53 division, have one set. So like an officer, one officer, and one nurse. That's correct. Well, no. Nice. No. Not every division has their own. Oh, it's okay. usually two divisions share. Okay. So I'm an officer from 33 division. Okay. 
32 division is our neighbor, and together we have one team with North York General Hospital. So I'll work one week with a nurse from North York General Hospital, and the officer from 32 will work the next week. But they cover, we cover both divisions. Yeah, different Sorry, yeah. So there is um, for uh, 33 and 32 division, which where uh, Nick was saying that we're from. So if um, Nick and I were working today, those that whole division is what we cover. And there's just yeah, and there's just him and I that cover it. So it's one MCIT team for two divisions. I mean, the eventual goal is to have each division have their own. That's going to take time. Yeah. That, that's the goal, right? And 24 yeah. hour coverage, but. There's some good recommendations in the Yakabuchi report around MCITs and how they can be better utilized. There was 84 recommendations, and there was a section in there on uh, MCIT and utilizing it. I just have a question at the back, and I'll take you. How do you decide which hospital is going to go to? That's a great. That's a great question. Uh, so for us, our home hospitals are North York General Hospital and Sunnybrook. So that's not to say though, if we meet somebody who's let's say has a very long history at CAMH, we'll take that individual to CAMH just to continue with continuity of care. If somebody was discharged from the Grace Hospital, from the Grace of Centenary, and they've had a bad experience, uh, if they were discharged uh, from any hospital in the, in the GTA yesterday, our uh, what we would do is, is that we would go back to that home hospital. Now, is it only your team that can make that decision? No, no. no. All, I see you're saying if they're in 30 usually if uh, I don't know do you yeah. want to speak to it usually we'll whatever police division will try and stick to their home hospital just because each division has a certain amount of officers if all the officers are out of the divisions to different hospitals kind of leaves us in a bad situation if an emergency comes up in our division if like my partner said if the client has a history of another hospital take them to another hospital it's not a problem we, we have some clients that just don't like, say, North York, for example, say, I don't like North York, I don't want to go back there, can we go somewhere else? Yeah, we, we'll take them somewhere else. Sometimes with the police, it's not as easy, because I said they're, they're kind of bound to a certain area. With us, we've got time, we can go anywhere in the city. You want to go to CAMH because you, you've got history there? We'll go to CAMH. We're not, we're not a primary response, so it's easier for us, it's harder for the divisional officers, because they're a primary response. They're assigned to North York, they have to provide 911 calls somewhere to work if they're all over the place and there's a child abduction or a homicide or something and everybody's out then it becomes a huge problem so they'll try and stick to the home area as well and obviously based on emergency right like how grave is the situation like if obviously if it's grave you're going to go to your nearest emergency department but if yeah, it's like not if someone's overdosed yeah you need to go to emergency room they're going to this the a lot of times one. it's up to ambulance as well they get redirected yeah so a lot of times i think I just i'll take the lady with the dark hair yeah So the Scarborough, the uh, yeah. So Scarborough has three police divisions, and they work with Scar with Rouge Valley, right? Yeah. Rouge Valley. Yeah. They have two MCIT teams just because of the huge area. For all three. Yeah. yeah, for all three. Yeah. Yeah, it's a it's a pretty big sector now for us. You can imagine if you get one call, you're off the board, and now the whole division. You know, is the CIT unit available? Well, no, they're on this call, or we're on this call. So, um, even like even in saying that, folks, it doesn't um, it doesn't drive us into like you know like we gotta go. And we don't do that. We've never had that. So, I think that's what makes this team so effective is that we don't have to rush. We're there to hear what you have to say, and we're there to help you. That's what we're here for. So, 
right? Like at that, and this, like if and if that's the case, then you have to look at that as um, an organization, and you need to make those kinds of. Uh, you need to address that. You know, we can only do so much, uh, and we try to do as much as we can. But after that, like our hands are tied, right? So you gotta remember, it took 15 years to get to this point. <laughs> yeah. So. I'm sure it's, it's only a matter of time. Well, actually, um, I think I heard on the uh, Peel and York are going to the MCIT yep, so model. This is also going to outside the GTA. So yeah. I mean, it's, it's the future. So. You know what? They're the next ones too that got a team. And I know that Durham was working in collaboration with Ontario Shores, which used to be called Whippy Mental Health. Uh, and they um, had an MCIT program. And now they're just in the middle of revising it because I think there was some uh, between Ontario Shores and Durham. So. That was one other question. Go ahead. Go ahead. Oh, I was just wondering if you have ever thought about uh, the use of a dog in your partnership, because I know a dog can Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Or even an adult feel calmer where... Sure, sure, sure. Wow, that's a... I've never heard that suggestion, actually. Just wow. Like a therapy dog. Yeah, yeah. Oh, yeah. That'd be fantastic. Wow. When did your role change? It's, it's Toronto Police policy that they don't send an officer by themselves to a situation where somebody's in an emotional crisis just because of the unpredictability, right. potential of volatility. They'll always send at least two officers. My partner's not considered a police officer, so if we go to a call, I'm the only officer, so that's why we are considered a secondary way. We have to go in concert with another officer. Usually, though, we'll have those other officers sit on the periphery just because it makes it easier for us to deal with the client if it's just us and not a horde of police officers. We always have other officers available nearby in case things go south and the situation has started to de-escalate. We've never had it happen so far in our team where we've had to call, an, at least I haven't, I don't know. No. Um, there's always that potential. Yeah. And uh, I mean, I think so far we've done a good job keeping the pot on the lid, like keeping things from escalating. Um, we have had to handcuff individuals at times. Um, it's always happened without incident, though. I mean, just to keep things, we could sense things were maybe going a little bit, so as a precaution. But uh, yeah, I mean, that, that, that option always, that potential is always there. I'm still a police officer at the end of the day with my use of force options, and we still have police nearby. Should we have to, okay, you know what? This is no longer an MCIT. This is now a safety risk. This person, it's not suitable for us to deal with them. Sometimes it's going to happen where this person needs to go to the hospital. They're too violent for us to take them. We're going to have regular police officers. There's been one or two times when police officers have followed us to the hospital with an individual just to make sure they, they remain, but we always keep them on periphery because we don't want to escalate things. I don't know if that answers your question. No, it does. Yeah. I would say it's important that we have you as a team. Is there is there a situation where sometimes this is beyond us, we can't we need to step back and, and the officer needs to come in to control the situation? ETF scene. We had an incident uh, two weeks ago where a gentleman was distraught, not sure what what his problem was. He was walking around a neighborhood with a knife and a hammer, knocking on people's doors and telling them that people were after him. So there were signs there that he had a mental illness. Um, regular police officers showed up 
we were on the way. Uh, when he saw the regular police officers, he climbed onto the roof of the nearest house. And it was kind of a standoff situation. So we, we arrived shortly afterwards. We were going to try and negotiate with this person. Our tactical team showed up just because he was still on the roof, still armed, and it's their mandate that they take over that situation. So we were kind of pushed off to the side while they negotiated. Every once in a while, they would come to ask, to ask us for advice. Okay, what sort of questions can we ask, this and that. So there are times when we're kind of pushed off to the side where sometimes it's just over our head. We're not gonna go onto the roof and try and de-escalate someone with a hammer. We'll, we'll speak to them from down below if necessary, but sometimes there is a time where we're just gonna sit off to the side and wait till things calm down. Maybe they're not gonna calm down and the regular police are just gonna end up taking him to the hospital. Maybe he's gonna go to jail. Maybe he's done something. In this case, the person demolished the roof. So there was also now a criminal aspect that had to be dealt with. We were on scene for four hours and we were never really, other than ask for advice by other officers, we never really got involved. There just wasn't anything for us to do. Okay. Yeah, what's your experience with people with autism? Good point. Um, before my experience in the mobile crisis team, myself personally, I worked in our family violence unit and I dealt with a lot of situations of child abuse and I do have some experience with children and autism. Um, in the mobile crisis aspect, I've, I've maybe gone to one or two calls involving that. So my experience in that regard is kind of limited. I don't know, Roberto from the North York side for MCIT. Uh, we, uh, there are calls uh, that we do attend that do have uh, uh, some do have an, um, a diagnosis of autism. I find autism, um, it's where on the spectrum that that individual is, is how the interaction is gonna go. So having that understanding minimally, uh, I think is um, I think is beneficial in terms of how you're going to interact effectively with this individual. Uh, it's all about knowledge, right? It's all about understanding that. And if, uh, like I was saying, if minimally, you have that your interactions are going to be better than worse so I, I hope that's answered your question yeah do we have yes we do uh, as I was mentioning the um, uh, the uh, child that we went to uh, two days ago uh, he had uh, a diagnosis of Asperger's uh, and again that's another uh, disorder that has a spectrum and where are they on that spectrum is and you'll see it quick I find as a nurse whether it be uh, autism Asperger's uh, schizophrenia bipolar it's where on that spectrum that you are and as long as you're open to that uh, as a clinician I think it, it benefits you rather than works against you so because your interaction is going to be according I hope your interaction is going to be according to what their uh, level of functioning is going to be so I hope that's answered your question any other question yeah go ahead do you guys ever um, go get to know individuals that might have been known to police and it might be likely that the police would be called in a situation so that you already have a rapport with the person yeah. so yeah and you got the, you understood that oh, okay there you go. Yeah, we'll have times where police will be going to a call and uh, we'll hear the name and we'll know the name and it may not be an immediate crisis but we'll say you know what um all of that yes and uh yeah <laughs> we have a rapport with this person and uh, we'll just tell the officers you know what just stand by don't you don't need to go and engage this person. They know us. We'll come there and speak to them. And just stay on the periphery if we need to. Yeah. Um, there are a lot of people that yeah, they, we, we have a rapport with them. And we know it's better that if they that they speak with us. And we'll just tell the officers, you know what? It's not an immediate If it's, it's an immediate situation, we can't get there first. And yeah, we're going to tell the officers, go and, and do what you need to do. But uh, there were, there's been times where we told you know what? Just, just kind of come back. We'll go. Or if we're not available right now, it's not immediate. 
see them later in the day. Like, yeah, we do have those individuals that we have a rapport with them. And a lot of times they'll call mm -hmm. dispatch and they'll say, I just want to see the MCIT. If you're going to send the regular police, don't bother. Just send the MCIT. Well, our dispatch is not allowed to just send us because we're not allowed for safety reasons to go just ourselves. But we'll just tell them, you know what, just tell the other officers, just hang back and let us go speak to this person. So yeah, we have a few people like that. Um, in the event that you guys are at a, at a situation and there's another call that's coming in, and another team would be dispatched. Is that how it would work? Sometimes. Sometimes we're asked to go to areas outside of our divisions mm -hmm. um, because their team's not available. Maybe they're tied up. And uh, we've done it on occasion, but uh, we are sponsored by North York General Hospital. The funding is for North York General Hospital. We try and remain to our hospital. Yeah. But yeah, we'll, we'll go and uh, we'll de-escalate de the situation. And if the situation is de-escalated, we'll usually leave it with the officers there and return to our area. And in that situation, um, any when you guys go to these scenes and there's notes taken, are you guys able to view other NCIT teams' notes? Because in the event, let's say, Bob. Oh, I see what right. you like. Let's you say. No. Right. I can see other officers' notes. Yeah. I, we have, uh, my partner has access to North Air General Hospital records. We don't have access to other hospital records. No. So if a person has a history, say, at Scarborough Grace, we won't have that history. We can. That's something you guys maybe could, it, or I don't know the legalities around it, but would be able to share that because, or I like to say, one central database to have that information because let's say the person does not like when someone speaks to him when he's standing. Yeah. A small example. Right. Um, kind of building those profiles, or is that something you're staying away from? Do you want to also we label would, them too? Because it can go both ways, right? Us personally, we would love to have access to the records of, because uh, it helps a lot. Right. If sure. we know the person's diagnosis and their history, it helps a tremendous amount. Mm -hmm. And like my partner said, if we're going to a call and that person's familiar to North York General Hospital, we know now how to approach the situation better. We're better armed with the knowledge. Uh, we would love to have the access from other hospitals, but that's levels way above us. It's a bureaucracy, okay. right? cases like that yet. Yeah. Would you have that in case this person calls, you need to contact this person, this family member, this is the access to the department. Right. There's, there's, yeah, there's a lot of stuff like that. So that was really helpful. Yeah. yeah. So if we can just do that, say I'm a service provider and the person I'm working with at current request, mm -hmm. can you call a general, a general number? I would speak to your community liaison officer. We have what's called CPIC, it's the Canadian Police Information Center. And what happens, we have something, when we get dispatched to a call, there's something called LOI, and that's location of interest. And if we have knowledge that 
person is known to hide knives in their house. Well, that's good information as an officer to know. So if an officer discovers that, yeah, you know what, this person has booby traps in their house, and I need that information to be known to other officers, they'll have that information put on CPIC, but it has to be put on by a police officer. So if you have information that you think needs to go on there for a client, I would contact your, uh, your community liaison officer and mention, you know what, this information would be useful to police. You gotta watch out for privacy issues, obviously. But I mean, if it impacts on their safety, yeah, like we have some clients that are, their mobility is challenged, and if we have to go to a call, they'll have like a lockbox or a keypad, and uh, their service care providers have provided that combination, so if we need to get inside to help them, we can access that. And I don't know how much, uh, I, I just found out about this recently, but there's the Toronto Police Services are trying to launch an app that in families who have individuals or service providers um, can call in and give their information. And if you, if you are a police officer who walks into the situation, this person has, this is their uh, diagnosis, this is what works to approach them, this doesn't work. Um, I just found out about it on Friday from my supervisor, but she did say that there's, it's still the early stages, because at this point, anybody may have access to that information, so a huge confidentiality yeah. issue there, um, so it's in the early stages, so I think that's kind of what we were talking about. Yeah. Um, people are supposed to be handcuffed from the back. I have handcuffed people to the front on certain occasions. Um, and we've had situations where it's not practical to handcuff somebody. Maybe somebody that's elderly, I'm not gonna handcuff them. Somebody that's got an injury to their, got a broken arm, I'm not gonna handcuff them. Right? Um, somebody that's, uh, some, some individuals are obese that you can't handcuff them. Our policies are though to handcuff to the rear. If you're going to handcuff to the front, it's it's very ineffective. Um, does it happen? Yeah, sometimes we'll handcuff to the front, but generally, um, we're not supposed to handcuff people to the front. It's it's a safety issue. If you're going to hand, if you need to handcuff somebody, if you're going to the extent where you have to handcuff somebody, you're supposed to be handcuffed to the back. But given this great experience that we're here today at the Bob Rumble Center, we'll definitely now we can take that into consideration. Yeah. I've never I've never heard of that, to be honest with you guys. But it'll definitely be taken into consideration for sure. Thank you so much. And I, I totally agree with the policy. Obviously if somebody is violent and you're getting to that point where you have to talk them, um, that is for sure something that you would want to contribute to me. The only point I wanted to contribute is if you cut them in the back because they are being violent, eventually they do calm down and that is the time where you would then reconsider cupping them in the front just so they can write back and forth with you, try and communicate some of you. If they're entering the back, they're totally in. Yep, that's a great point to consider and something I never thought of. Usually though when somebody comes down, the handcuffs come off completely. That's a good point. And she's saying, okay, they're right. I, I was saying that when you're thinking about it, if one else has the right to speak, he puts their hand cut behind their back, but when you cut them in the front, there's someone who signs that state when they're right. That's an excellent point. Mm -hmm. And that's something we'll take away from in this presentation. I've been a police officer 15 years and I still, I'm learning things every day. And that's, yeah, you know what, that's, that's an excellent point. Yeah. yeah. 
say, I think the woman in front of me, I think she was a part of the movement for the Voices Registry. Yeah. Yeah. Are we going to talk about that today? The what? I thought that was. The Vulnerable Persons Registry? Mm -hmm. oh. How was that? After having that, was there a, a, a police officer in, in the North region who has a child with autism? Mm -hmm. And he has a kid who likes to run. Mm -hmm. And he frequently goes missing. And I think he actually spearheaded um, this whole petition to bring forward some kind of vulnerable persons registry so that put out to to all I guess I guess EMS police everyone in hospitals immediately when the situation arises. But I don't think it's gone past no, I, it's very early no, 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 no. But I think it's a. I think it's a great idea. Ma'am, I bought this press and they're not going to talk about it today. It's very early stages. Um, if, so if, course, if, if you if you want to find out more, I would call definitely the community relations yeah. individual at each station. They released uh, like a memo saying it's really early, so people yeah. have time to work. Yeah. I think it's just a new one. Here. You know, for just the the when uh, like when we finish with our uh, individual, however it goes, we both are required to submit reports. On my end is from the Ontario Nurses, uh, the ONA, and my college. I need to put notes in. So my notes are always going to be available to the other MCIT nurse. Nick's notes are going to be available to all the officers on the force. So given that um, this team now, when we put in a report, those concerns will come up. Individual has special need. Individual has. So our report writing is, I guess, our footprint to every other call. And if you're an officer or a nurse and you're going to take the time to go into an, oh yeah, hey, you know what, they say, uh, you're going to take that, right? But I like the idea of the vulnerable persons because we have a lot of people, mm -hmm. especially it's becoming more commonplace now. We have an older population in our division and we get a lot of wandering seniors and we don't know where they live. They have no ident identification on them, nothing. To have some kind of database where we can say, you know what, yeah, we know this person. They're supposed to live at this address and here's a phone number and we, that would be so much, so much easier. Yeah, that, that's a great idea. Any other questions for us? I was asked to give some examples about uh, some positive situations and some negative situations. I want to start off with a positive situation that just highlights how great an advantage it is for me as a police officer to have a mental health nurse working with me. I attended one call where a gentleman had texted a friend that he was going to commit suicide and that he was at home and that uh, this was it for him, it was the end. So we attended, officers were there before us, and this person had a uh, had some negative history with police, had been on charges before, so he wasn't a fan of the police, and he had basically barricaded his door, and, and when he saw the police, he said, you know what, you're not coming into this house, get off my driveway. And uh, I thought, okay, this is gonna be uh, some kind of standoff situation. And I'm thinking to myself, how are we going to de-escalate the situation? So as we're trying to talk to him, and he, he's cursing up a storm, he looks over my shoulder and he sees Roberto. Oh, hi, Roberto. And I'm looking at Roberto. <laughs> and Roberto looks at him and he says, is that you? Oh yeah. And I look at Roberto and you know this gentleman? Oh yeah, he used to be a patient at North York and I used to work with him. So down came the barricade. I said, can we come and talk to you? I know Roberto, he's my partner. Oh yeah, you guys can come in, open the door, sit down, had a seat, had a long talk with him. And we've had maybe one or two interactions with him since, that was almost a year ago. And his attitude now towards the police has de-escalated just because of that, the fact that he knew Roberto. And when we attended and he saw Roberto, that was a calming presence for him. So now just his whole interaction with police has considerably changed. It's no longer the confrontational, lock the door, you want to come in here, there's going to be trouble type attitude, you know. And to me, that, that's probably 
the most positive experience I had having a nurse there just because of that. How was this going to go if we didn't have a nurse? That was probably going to be a violent confrontation. They, they probably would have had to have breached the door, dragged them out against his will, taken them to the hospital. Who knows how that would have ended, right? People would have gotten hurt probably, but because he saw a familiar face, it changed everything. As for negative experiences, I can't say that we've really had a negative experience. We've had to take clients to the hospital who obviously don't want to go, but we've had to take them. So if you ask them what they think of MCIT, they're going to say, yeah, those are people that took me to the hospital even though I didn't want to go. I mean, sometimes we can't avoid that. They got to go to the hospital, they got to go. And they may not like us because of that. Some people were disappointed when we show up and they see that we're in uniform and we're with an, in a marked police car. That, that's beyond our control. I would like to do plain clothes, but that's not a decision that we make. It's been set by our administrators, so for now, some people aren't happy with that. But I don't know, too, I, I can't think of any encounter I've gone to and people say, yeah, I don't want those MCIT guys coming back. They were jerks. So I, I can't think of an experience like that. There have been times where a call has been come across as maybe somebody that's in emotional crisis, but they weren't and we end up going there and it's not a call for us. Um, person may just be drunk, there's no emotional issues, or they're involved with a dispute with their neighbor and there's no mental health issues, it's just, they're emotional, but it's not really within our mandate, it's more of a regular police mandate. And we've shown up there and it wasn't really our thing, we've tried to resolve the situation. There may have been some criminal issues that had to be dealt with, so those are probably my negative experiences because it wasn't something where we could have helped a person. And they were basically, well, why are you here? You can't help me. I want to press charges against this person or that person, or there needs to be some kind of criminal investigation, which isn't our mandate. So that's probably, I would say, Roberto, our negative yeah. examples. I don't know if there's any examples you want to add, if you want to talk about Ruth. Or... Uh, yeah, so we, uh, the first week in our existence, um, we get called to, uh, she 84? So we went to an 84 uh, year old um, home, and her initial call was that. Her sons are taking money out of her bank account. Yeah, so that's why we were there. My sons, ah, I just... So she was receiving services from one of the community agencies, a variety of services. Uh, unfortunately, um, she, her personality was a little bit... Boisterous. Boisterous. Uh, and needed, I guess, a, a certain interaction type she had exhausted all of the services that she had fired them um, and had no longer services coming in to help her she had just a further elaborate she had some mobility issues and mm. in order to access her home um, the service workers would have to call her yeah. for, for her to provide the passcode yeah. and uh, to say that her at her demeanor was boisterous is an understatement she can be quite belligerent and quite rude to the, the people coming to service, so like yeah. very demeaning and derogatory yeah. comments to the staff to the point where they didn't want to go. They no. felt threatened by her. They felt insulted by her and they weren't going there. So she was kind of painting herself in a corner because she couldn't survive without these yeah. services. The services weren't willing to go in. Yeah, family was pretty distant as well. I'm sure this scenario, I'm sure is very common theme. Um, so with uh, this individual, uh, there was alleged that she has uh, was becoming more violent and throwing telephones at people. And so that call, we um, were a big uh, were a big support uh, supports or supporters of autonomy and dignity and. Uh, always going to the hospital isn't the answer. So, uh, Nick
Nick and myself uh, began uh, collaborating with the community services that she was dealing with and was firing on a daily basis and didn't want nothing to do with on a daily basis into saying that Look, this, she's going to be needing some services. Well, she exhausts and she's violent. And so at the end of the day, it, um, it came down to uh, this individual was not able to look after herself at home anymore, unfortunately. And she wasn't in a position that she was wanting to have individuals come into her home. And in saying that, in that case, she was apprehendable under the Mental Health Act and was taken to hospital for further assessment. And that saga went on for a while because we would bring her in, stabilize, discharge, services added, but then it was just a repeating, it was just a repeating thing. So in, we tried hard to keep her out of the hospital, but it became best inevitable because she was, I mean, she was bedridden. Yeah, and, and she was just not able to care for herself. So, um, and to just give you guys a range of, of what we deal with, you know, as uh, civilization begins to age, this is what we're coming up uh, with this scenario a lot. Of the scenario of the individual that's uh, uh, an older adult, wants to remain in their home, but their faculties just aren't able to keep them in their home anymore effectively. So um, in this instance, uh, with, the, with this individual, the community services were, I guess, relying on us to go in and to provide this uh, individual with meals for the day, uh, care for the day. So we had to step back and we had to get involved with the community services and we actually had to go to Richmond Hill to have a case conference and to uh, inform these individuals that we're not an extension of healthcare. And this is what we were being deemed as. Well, you know, MCIT is gonna go in and deal with them. Yeah, to make somebody a meal for the day isn't one of our mandates. Not to say we won't do it, but it's just like there has to be, the picture has to be, well, we're doing this because we're gonna be keeping them in the community until other help arrives, right? So that that case was, uh, wow, that was, that was ongoing for a while. So, uh, in the end, uh, the individual is in a better place. So, so that was uh, that was a positive outcome. So. Speaking of the tsunami that you're talking about, that's going to be happening in the senior community, mm -hmm. um, and actually vulnerable people in general, mm -hmm. our, as our sector cuts back on services, is there any means? I mean, you guys provide um, some kind of stats or information that goes. These are the calls that we're getting. This is how people um, don't have case management. They don't yeah. have uh, community connections. They don't have that. Like, is there a need to be collecting information yeah. so this moves so, forward, right? So this whole scenario yeah. with the senior, yeah. really, sh you shouldn't be involved. That's a community service, right? That should be something that should be in place in the community. You're right. That should be engaging her. It should be. You. Yeah. But this is a good window. Mm -hmm of opportunity to bring this forward to say this is a misuse and actually costs a hell of a lot more to get you involved. Sure. So I'll I'll speak from the, the hospital end. Um, in terms of uh, metrics, yeah. um, so there are uh, there is a I hate them wow. too. <laughs> so there's a lot of information that I need to enter into a computer system that we have uh, with each call. So each call, uh, there are metrics being gathered. Uh, you know, specific uh, cases like qualitative data. That's going to be that'll come from me and telling them, hey, you know what? This is what I'm finding. But in terms of metrics, yeah, we collect it all the time. We collect it all the time. So there is somebody behind the scenes that uh, all of this data is collected. Those uh, the 
these individuals, the central Lin, is who provides us with the monies to do this project. So they're going to have questions as to where are our dollars going and where, who are you guys serving. And all of this is collected at a hospital level and I'm sure at the police level as well.